Hello, gang. It's CNET Live. We're live at the CNET stage at CES. This is the best of CES 2018, day two. Now, you could say we are smack in the middle of this show at this point. Here we are at the end of the full day that we've had, and press conferences are behind us, which Scott and I brought you as things kicked off yep. on Monday. I'm here with Scott Stein, my personal physician. Thank you for being here as usual. We're doing well. We're hanging in there. All right, thank you. Keep an eye on me. Keep Purelling. I need you here. Uh, we're here for the next 20 minutes or so. We're going to boil down for you the best products that CNET editors, and there's 90 of us here, by the way, have seen here at this, the largest consumer electronics show on earth. Kicking it off, I nominate the power outage. Oh, for crying out loud. There was a power outage. It was First, a big deal. First, there was rain. Yep. Then we there were. was darkness. Yes. CES. Yes. And the rain led to the darkness. That was, that was... Look at everyone's out there walking around slack-jawed. Never seen power out before. It is actually a cruel irony. You come to a show here that showcases the future of a world that can't exist without power, and you yank that cord. It is a deep inner meta discussion of what we're going to do. Yes. Like if they're gonna, in the end, they're going to say, see, we're, see, we're getting you to think about power solutions. We told you you were stupid. Infrastructure, smart cities. The power outage hit the North Hall, the South Hall, our, uh, our, sorry, the Central Hall, our South Hall here where we're based, kept running. That's because somebody above shines a happy face on the red ball, wherever we are. Now, I love the Utterly Unattainable is one of my first nominees. It's the LG Roll-Up OLED TV. It solves a real pain point, and that is TVs are ugly. When you're not watching content on them, you sure as hell don't want to look at black plastic gech on your wall. So this guy rolls up out of a relatively small cabinet Almost looks like a short throw projector. Yeah. And it's OLED. It's impossibly aspirational. And you can put it just partway up as well and have kind of this eyebrow display as like a, a home information console if you're that much of a nerd. You don't want to pull out your phone. You just, I just want, no, my, I just exactly. want my, my heads up little mini oh my, exactly. TV. Exactly. Oh, I want my heads up ribbon display in the living room. <laughs> What's the weather? Right. <laughs> Zick. Zick. Bring it back down. It's super slick. It's, it's exceedingly drool worthy. Uh, well, I'm going to discuss something that I just saw today. Speaking of, uh, I keep following VR, the yeah. HTC Vive Pro. Now, where does VR go from here? We That's a hit question this. I've been asking all week. Yep, yeah, good experiences, and then what? Well, interestingly enough, HTC and Vive are going the other direction, not affordability, but, but <laughs> higher-end enterprise. It's not a crazy idea. Okay. Higher resolution, wireless. It was the first Intel Ygig technology that I've seen that is an adapter that allows you to cut the cord and move around freely, and that's going to be sold even if you have the original Vive. And that's a trend you'll see, eventually all VR headsets will be wireless. It fit better on my head, they distributed the weight and okay. on my weird head and all heads. And, uh, and it basically is a better VR thing, has a wider range. Now, are you going to buy that? Probably not, but they're pushing the envelope on stuff that will inevitably be in VR and make it better and more comfortable for wireless people. Wireless and cordless is incredibly important. Incredibly. Yeah. I can't tell you how much of a hurdle that is to people who are already wigged out by the idea they've got to put something on their face, cut themselves off from the world, stop multitasking, stop having you know, some kind of contact with people that are around them. There has not been a face-worn technology that took off in the consumer market since 1784 bifocals. It's been a long time coming. So you got to get past these human machine hurdles before any use case is going to print. I applaud this very much. I'm glad you spotted it. I did that surgery simulator. This was actually done with, I think, Stanford. Yeah. And it was trying to explore not accuracy, but to just get you the feel. It, it's, How the was control, it? It was cool. Wonky controls, but okay. it made you realize, oh, now I understand how to put a stent Maybe I know what a stent is. I told you. I don't know how to this put a stent in. This is my personal physician, Dr. Scott Stein. Everyone thinks I'm kidding. He's going to put a stent in my arm later. This is I, fantastic. I know what that simulation tells me it's supposed to be like. Here's another one that's almost hard to believe. So let's just stay in the medical uh, sphere for a minute. The Oleus Systems Quad Quarter. Now, this is right out of original Star Trek stuff, but it's better than a quad tricorder. It's a quad quarter. That thing's about the size of a business card and, what, about a quarter inch thick. It'll sense heart rate respiration, heart anomalies, temperature, and this is interesting, heart signature. They say that everyone's uh, EKG is a unique signature like a fingerprint. They can tell an individual by looking at that chart. 
That's new. I that hadn't I had heard not, that before. That I had not I seen. I hadn't either. And this thing is fully contactless. I'll be honest, I got to see it and grill them a little more. It's got the stink of a little bit of vapor on it. But I know this technology is actually being done in the medical sphere. And Volvo had something similar. They had a heartbeat and respiration detector in their cars a few years ago. Wasn't popular. They dropped the option. But it was a way for you to tell if there was someone waiting in your car to attack you and it would show up as a heartbeat on the key fob as you approached your car. It's the same core technology, I think, so this is legit, but the idea that you just wear this like a pendant or keep it in your pocket, wow. and it's constantly doing okay. these four measurements, Yeah, pretty, pretty cool stuff. You found the sequel to Face ID, Heart Signature. That's right, Heart Signature. That right is the future. Is Heart Signature. <laughs> Meet us in three years. Let's see if that right happens. Right here, right here. I have a weird fantasy of filling my home's walls with colored lights. I'm not ashamed to admit it. NanoLeaf, uh, which Rye Chris covered, makes these crazy multicolored glowing panels. I love this. I love this. Yeah, everybody's yep. falling in love with this. Yep. And, and now they're back and they're showing these square pixel like, it's like Minecraft meets like crazy fantasy wall. And they have these here. They're touch sensitive, they're gesture controls. Yeah. It works with Siri, Alexa, Google Assistant. And there's some crazy glowing dodecahedron controller. And I want that too. Just to sit in my room surrounded by colored glowing lights with my. Why do we both love this? I don't know. It's, it's oddly useless, but it's, it's fascinating. It brings me back to like Atari games or Isn't something. Isn't it great? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's, it's all 8-bit it's all looking stuff. It's, it's, it's low res, it's blocky, it's oddly creative. I will never be allowed to install this in my house. No, there's no I spouse acceptance get factor clearance here to do this. whatsoever, whatsoever. But we it, a, it's cool. The yeah, cool it lights. is very cool. I, I spotted it too and said, oh, I wonder if Scott's going to like this as much as I do. And isn't that weird? I do. We had a slew of car announcements, the most tangible of which was Samsung's very credible entry into the automotive cabin. Now, they bought a company called Harman last year. You may know them for Harman Kardon Audio, which you very likely have in your car. Real, real big maker of in-car technology. So now Samsung overnight is a major supplier, arguably the number one supplier, of in-car electronic connected technology. We already know they have a huge footprint in mobile and a huge footprint in smart home gear. So you see what I think now is a company that has the most credible argument to say that we are going to be the first to connect homes, cars, and mobiles in a, in a true ecosystem, to use that hackneyed old term, that really works. Smart things, appliances, Harman, the largest maker of in-car electronics. This is a powerful combination. Now, there's plenty of real work they have to do to make it happen, yeah. but this was an amazing alliance that I think kind of got under-touted under here at the show this, this week. Um, I've been trying to catch up on car tech uh, and uh, at every moment, it's everywhere. Uh, fitness wise, I didn't get to see this either, but Peloton, a company that makes bikes with training integrated, yeah. is making a treadmill, Peloton Tread. Now if you want to look at the future of gyms, your next fancy gym where you're going to work out, it's meant to offer an immersive experience like the bikes. And training is going to become something even more important when you're looking at fitness tech. More than the equipment, perhaps. And you're seeing a lot of companies try to break through into training. That's been a big success story for them. Smarter fitness tools like this could be the new luxury thing, if you can afford $4,000. Yeah, these are multi-thousand dollar rigs, this right? This is my They're brother-in-law's bike. thing. He's going to put that in his basement next, in his nice sports bar. And these are basement. live sessions with people on the cloud in, who are Peloton members. Who can, uh, yeah. Can and led in. by a leader who is a trainer, I, I, from what I understand. Yeah, it's basically like, I laugh because it's like, I do not do those things. I basically walk, <laughs> I'm basically- All I do on this is fall off it. Uh, yeah, that's I'm all lucky I if do. I get to an elliptical and I just play some John Williams music for a little while. Oh, and that's my- Very good, that's excellent, inspiring. excellent, excellent. Get some good, oh, inspiring an aristocrat. John Williams tracks. Oh, very nice. Yeah. Okay, let's go outside now for a quick moment to Brian Tong, who is at a company that many people never expect to see here. Google, for the first time, perhaps ever, they have a vast presence at CES, showing off their hardware in particular. Let's find out exactly what's going on there. BT is going to tell us what's up. What's up at Google, BT? What's up, everybody? Back here at CES 2018, the greatest technology showcase on planet Earth. Here we are at Google's booth. I've been here for 10 years. This is the first time Google has brought an actual booth to the show in the great outdoors of CES. We're actually outside of the halls. And you can see we have an up, it's kind of like a two level building that you can all come and visit. They'll feature a lot of different things, some of the new technology that Google's working on. Also obviously feature the Google Assistant, which is a huge theme here at the show. So what we want to do is kind of take you inside a few of the rooms. Some you'll be able to get to, some will tell you if they're too, but most of the stuff that you see here, you're going to be able to come and check out for yourself and just experience it. So let's head over out here to what they call the gallery. 
and kind of mosey our way through. Excuse me, sir. No, you're good to go. Thanks, man. <laughs> all right, so here we go. This is the gallery. What it has is Google's technology and all the different devices that they're partnering with. There's over 350 devices here that have some sort of integration with the Google Assistant. We have obviously the smart displays. These are like our personal assistant screens from Lenovo, JBL, LG. We have those all here, big th hot theme here. We all know about speakers integrated with the Google Assistant as well. Really everything here at the show, it's all about AI and everyone wants to put Google's brains in their devices. And as the platform has grown, so have their partners. We have some great sound headsets here, JBL across the board with their speakers and their headphones. You got this big boom in JBL Link 500. You gotta love that. And then even things like appliances, LD signatures, washer dryer combo, and even some other cool stuff phones, LG's Tone Platinum headsets, the LG V30, and things like the Cord Zero R9, right? Your little robotic vacuum. Now when you come in here, you'll also see a lot of different things, a lot of different appliances, uh, things like over here. This is kind of a fun one because it's littered with so much stuff. We have different thermostats, obviously Netatmo, we have the Nest, Honeywells, Ecobees. Up top, you'll see a row of all the different smart light bulbs. And it just is here to showcase and feature everything that, again, has the brains. Now, what I also love about this is Google decided to kind of have some fun here. There's nothing necessarily smart about this, but what this is is really kind of a, a fun interactive demo, a little diorama, really cute and stylized. And think of it as like a living city that Google has put on here just to showcase some of the fun stuff. You'll have moving cars. You have the bank in the center with a rotating dollar sign. It's really fun. And just to kind of add that little charm of how Google is really moving towards a smart type city setup and just a great way to like to display. It's just really cool stuff. So come inside here, check it out, and be sure to you know see all the great stuff that they have here. Look at John Kim, my photo talk. Just getting low with that. Getting those low angles, baby. Get that. All right, so we're going to come and head out here again. This gallery is available for you, everyone that's here at the show, to go and check out yourself. We're going to take this outside, and then we're going to head to another area. There's also above us a Google Assistant experience, and what they really want to showcase is, sure, we have all these devices here, but also, how do they work? What are the things you can say to the Google Assistant, and how are we going to get people a lot more comfortable with using these AI assistants throughout the day and throughout, really, in their normal life? Now, we're going to swing over this way and uh, navigate around here. And this is one place that uh, I've got to be honest with you. You kind of got to have the cool kids card to get upstairs. This, we're going to take you up these stairs very carefully and then uh, take you kind of to the top floor. They get a really cool view of everything. So uh, you go VIP with BTZ. Let's go. All right. Thank you, guys. All right. So this is, check this out. This is kind of their rooftop upstairs exclusive area. They've got a lot of Google Maxes featured, like playing music. They even have, yeah, you feel that beat? It's already out. It's out and available right now. $3.99. It sounds amazing. Now, this is kind of a fun thing that we have here. <laughs> Over on this spot, it's like dark and everything, but they're going to treat you out. Look at We've got Google, do, I do nuts for donuts, baby. Right here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save one of these for you. JK, this one's for you. This is, I'm going to just feed you right here. Yeah, mm, eat that, eat that, eat that. Yeah, eat that, eat that. Here we go. <laughs> All right, so you have this kind of bar area, just a cool hangout, but let's kind of show you the view from this perspective. There's not many booths that really give you this cool view of the entire show. So we're out here on the front edge, and this is, look, a really cool look over there. That's the South Hall right now. You can see the entire, this is the show floor from kind of a different perspective at CES. You could just see how massive and scale this entire thing is. <laughs> That great big CES balloon is kind of like a signal to let you know you're upstairs enjoying the big show. And uh, if you look carefully, you might even be able to see a little CNET ball out there, you know? Some a company that covers technology quite well from what I've heard, from what I've heard. All right, let's just head out here. Check this out one more time now. I don't know. I don't know if we're going to try this. Should, you know, I'm going to ask my photo. John, are, are you ready? Do you want to do this? Do you want to do this? <laughs> He's getting, he's getting his rig unassembled. We're going to hold you for a second. This is going to be the first ever slide 
camera slide. This is, this is, this is boss. This is legitimately boss. So upstairs here, you got a great view, but look, not all of you again can go down the Google slide. We want to give you like that feeling of what it feels like. So we're going to send John Kim, my amazing photographer to experience this so that you can experience it. So John, be careful. Look at this. Use of slide is at your own risk. <laughs> Curl up in a ball. Curl up in a ball. <laughs> oh. Turn the camera around on you, John. Show yourself. Show yourself. He did it. All right. We're going we're gonna to come down now. I can see you. We're coming down, baby. We're coming down. <laughs> oh. Oh. All right. We did it. That's a quick look. Awesome booth here. Google's, you know, hey, Google, Google Assistant booth. That was awesome. You went down the slide. I went down the slide. We'll have plenty more coverage, CES 2018. Stick with us. T, let's talk about this uh, last technology we want to bring to you with Jessica Dolcourt here uh, that she's very excited about. And this is one of the holy so grails good. of phone engineering. It finally happened, fingerprint sensor without a visible sensor. Yeah, it seems like such a small thing, but in the phone world, it's a really big deal. So I went and I saw a phone made by Chinese phone maker Vivo, uh -huh. and it's got an in-display fingerprint reader. It's okay. actually underneath the display, and so the there display is, is what's underneath the glass. On the outside. Exactly. Okay. So you have the entire expanse of the six-inch screen, huh. and you have a fingerprint area. It's where the home button would be. You kind of press it a little bit. You really got to put a little bit okay. of force there, mm. and it unlocks. So far, it's it's pretty fast. It's fairly accurate, but this was a pre-production model. The beauty of all of this is that there's no physical button taking up the screen. It's there when you need it, yeah. and then it totally disappears, and then you use gestures, sort of like what you would find on the iPhone 10 to get around instead of pressing a home button. Another pet peeve that I have personally, uh, there are finger print readers on the backs of phones. Yeah. That's another popular place to put it. If your phone is laying down next to you and you want to use it, you have to pick it up and unlock oh. it that way every single time if you don't want to swipe and do a pin or pattern or something like that. So it's very, um, it's very specific, important technology that was rumored to be in the Samsung Galaxy phones and then in the iPhone 10, and that never happened. And we're seeing it for the first time, not as you know, just this fanciful thing, but as a real life working model, not a prototype, uh, from a Chinese phone maker. I yeah. think that this is something that we're going to start seeing in premium phones in 2018 and beyond. It's going to be a little bit more expensive to make and use, uh, so that's, this is not something we're going to see in every single phone in the next year. It's going to be uh, very selective. And to be clear, the company, the Vivo, has the first uh, prototype here. Synaptics did the part. So Synaptics other brands could have this. a company that makes the component. So I actually was able to see the sensor and the circuitry that they use yeah. to put under there. Right now, it's only localized. So so you can't put your finger anywhere on the screen. You really have to put it in that one area. But they kind of light it up digitally so you know exactly where to go. You're just home and okay. right in on it. I was going to ask you that. Yeah. Interesting. What do you think, Scott? Big deal or uh, yeah, micro first world problem? No, I think it's great. And I, I still feel like something like Face ID it, it needs to be improved a little more. And for accessibility, I think you should have a fingerprint sensor anyhow. Maybe you could combine them. Yeah. And the other thing, phones are one thing, but... Things like this. Oh, yeah. I feel like you know you have to add a, a passcode on this, not just for smartwatches, but for any little thing that you want to authenticate. You could start putting this now instead That's of worrying about fingerprint yeah, sensor. The, even the sometimes the smaller real estate, because you're pointing out the benefit Pendants. of getting more real estate. Well, Jessica. you get more screen real estate, but in addition to that, I mean, if you've got yeah. something like Face ID, which we're also going to see on phones in 2018. Yeah. I, I wake up in the morning, I look at my phone. If my face is smashed in a pillow, it's not going to recognize me. Your fingerprint, exactly. if it's dark, if your face is obscured for whatever yeah. reason, you always have that biometric backup. I would love to see the two of them together. Okay. All right. I'm convinced. I got to say, I came into this thinking it was, okay, you know, gilding the lily, but you've pointed out some use cases here, uh, both of you, where it it's actually size. sounds like a path to some really yeah. cool new it's devices. It's really sophisticated technology. It's very simple, and it's one of those things that maybe doesn't sound like a big deal, but I think we'll see established use cases that 
actually sure yeah. that this is this is sort of I'm, a wave of the future. I'm starting to see it. Uh, one that I was uh, excited to see more of, I think, and that was more phones l along the lines of the Axon M folding phone. We didn't get a folding we revolution. We did not get any foldable phones here at the show. This is something that we've been talking about. We know that there are various phone makers that have patents on this that are planning it. Samsung said we were going to get one this year. Uh, so we're still waiting for that, and we don't exactly know what it's going to look like. So that the ZTE Axon M has a thick seat in the middle. It's basically two 5.2 inch screens next to each other. Yeah. And it folds open like a book. It has some really legitimately cool use cases and potential. Um, however, it's one of those things where there are just like a lot of really weird kind of I don't know, like hurdles to usability. So, you know, it makes you left handed artificially, whether you are or huh. not. It feels really imbalanced. These are something that the phone makers are going to have to work on in order to make this compelling for everyday use, not just like, oh, great idea that I will never buy. And also, the specs have to be, you know, they, they have to match. The yeah. price has to match the specs. So you will pay more for okay. two screens. Okay, yeah. But if you've got last year's technology, yeah. do you really want it? I can uh, tell you, a lot, of, uh, a lot of advertisers I've spoken to here at the show, many of whom attend here, they're intrigued by the idea of dual screens because it helps to solve the battle between content interrupting or stomping on advertising and vice versa, and all the viewability that everyone's key about. Just give each camp its own screen simultaneously. Here's the content on the left, here's the ad they bought on the right, no one's worried about viewability. They're both viewable. But then somehow the ads will end up on both screens. Exactly. <laughs> that's the, you'll that's never the find problem. a way around it. Right. That's yeah, the a problem. Third screen. Yep. Yep. Uh, You're on it. I'm not so as sold on the dual thing. Although I, I feel like this is more gimmicky. But I think about the Nintendo DS and how I felt about that when it came out. And I thought that was the most gimmicky thing. And then it became a really amazing game system. So you never know. I just I feel like it needs yep. to be really good. I think you find ways to use it in your everyday life or you don't. So with a folding I'm phone. Leaning, I'm leaning don't, <laughs> but one, yeah. One of the use cases is, is multitasking, right. right? So you can have your video on one screen and do something else on the other. Yeah. You can open it up and have a larger display if you don't have an ugly seam down the middle. Mm. Or uh, I kind of like this, I don't know if I would use it, but you can sort of fold it like a tent and imagine you're sitting across from somebody at, on a table, you can watch the same video. Or like a mini laptop. Or like a mini laptop. Kind of like that mm. Lenovo exactly. concept with the keyboard, like mm -hmm. maybe you're yeah. typing something. Yeah. yeah. Uh, to wrap here, the one that everyone was just wondering if it might arrive and didn't. Galaxy S9, what's your forecast on it now? I never thought it was going to come here. That is okay. not part of Samsung's historical release cycle. It just doesn't happen this early. So uh, that is a phone that is widely expected to come at Mobile World Congress, which is the end of February, okay. um, leaning into March. Or, uh, quite possibly, if Samsung doesn't hit that target date, it could come as a standalone event afterwards. We've seen yeah. that happen with two of the Samsung phones, where that event would take place in New York, but yeah. it's short. So you're either going to get end of February or you know, to mid-March. And then we'll see the phone um, hit store shelves probably late March, April. I'm guessing all of this, but just based on years and years and years of yeah, galaxies. Yeah, that cycle. Yeah. I mean, we're like about 10 years in. To the Standard issue, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, there's a certain muscle Probably memory We're now. fairly Bond. confident that this will happen. Yeah. Um, you know, it will be interesting to see if some of that technology finally does make it into the Galaxy S9. Uh, the most realistic use case, I think, will not be that the S9 is foldable, um, but that it could have a fingerprint sensor in screen or under screen, just like That'd the Vivo cool. phone that we saw. I was going to say, that's interesting, because you know, if you look at the production time, obviously they would, they would have had to have been engineering this new part in to the yeah. spec for the S9, so I wonder how they would feel about the fact that someone else stole their thunder, and yet they'd be the first big phone, perhaps, to have it. You know, it. I actually think it's the other way around. I think, you know, this, the interest around Vivo could be sort of a validation if Samsung's planning this, because this is something people are getting excited about. It's hyped up. Uh, yeah. The Vivo phone is not announced. We don't have a name. We don't have a price. We don't know when it's, it's coming to prototype. market. It's, yeah. it's yeah. pre-production, but ready for production. Okay. So we don't know when this is coming out. It's very possible. You know, Oftentimes, when a company announces it first, they're not always first to market. Samsung is a global brand. Vivo is really mostly known in China. So and this is, Vivo's this game here yeah. could be Samsung's gain as well. All right. That happens with Synaptics. In the past, you know, sometimes you'll see a concept, and then you will see it emerge 
in another product, you know, yeah. over the course of fingerprint sensors. Yeah, the trial like, balloon brand is here. The main go to market brand is over here. It's a good harbinger of it. Yeah, I mean, we've, uh, okay. we've also yeah. seen things come to other phones first, like wireless charging and waterproofing, and then Apple yeah. comes along and it's like it's been invented for the oh, first time. Of course, time. well, that, right. that whole pixie right. dust is a whole other story. All right, thank you, Jessica. Appreciate it. Thanks for the update. Very interesting technology there. That's it for day two of CES, everybody. For myself and Scott, uh, Scott Stein, thanks for watching. We'll get that stent done afterwards if you want to go scrub yeah, up I'm and get ready. Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, sure. good, great.